Hello everyone! Welcome back to the podcast. Today's episode I'm very excited about. It has probably been one of the most requested and that would be the birth story of our sweet baby girl, Miss Ashton Lily Lutz, who was born on 22221, February 22nd of this year, 2021. Um, she was 38 weeks and two days, so she came a little early, which we were praying because she was on track to be a very big baby. And she was born at seven pounds, six ounces, 19 and a half inches long. And it was the coolest, craziest, most amazing experience ever. So I'm going to just share with you guys her birth story slash a little bit of, um, you know, my personal story to get to this point. So a lot of you do know our story already, um, but I'm going to kind of go back and we're just going to, I'm going to bring you up to speed to this pregnancy because the past kind of informs why we made the decisions that we did um, when delivering Ashton. So first things first, I basically was having a hard time getting pregnant. Um, we were trying to conceive and I know there are a lot of you out there who are in the same boat and that is a very intense, um, very intense journey because as much as you're like, oh, this has nothing to do with me. Like the only thing I can do is have sex. <laughs> like that's literally the only thing we have control over everything else and try to have sex at the right time of the month and use the ovulation trips. But there's only so much we can do. And then the rest is, you know, up to God, up to our bodies. And so Kellen and I had been trying and it wasn't happening. And I was like, oh, now also a little piece of tidbit, tidbit from my past. I have always had the hardest, hardest periods, like really, really rough. Um, that's a whole nother episode. But basically, I found a new gynecologist, um, one that kind of more specialized in fertility. And I went to her and she's like, you know what? I want to send you to get an MRI because I think that there are some fibroids in there. Well, I can see them just on the ultrasound. So I want to see how, how many, how big. And so I went to... Um, the doctor or to the no, I went she was the doctor but I went to the office got an MRI she I had already a follow-up appointment set that was I think a week a week and a half later because if you know doctor's appointments at least here in the states it takes a while sometimes to get back in to see the doctor unless there's an emergency so that being said I already had an appointment set up and I get a call and I think that I think it was the day after or two days after I think actually it was the day after my MRI I get a call from the doctor's office and she said hey can you come in in like the next two days it was like so soon I'm like oh I'm like yeah I can but I already have an appointment set up for next week and she's like yeah she has some things she wants to talk to you about so can you come in sooner and that's never good right when the doctor is like hey I'm clearing room for you I'm I'm literally rescheduling patients so I can get you in here I was like oh no what's going on and of course they won't tell you anything over the phone so that being said, I went into the office, she shows me my MRI. My uterus is essentially just being crowded out by fibroids. Um, during this time of finding this new doctor, getting the order to get the MRI, we actually got pregnant and had a miscarriage. It was very early on, but I remember just being so sad and so devastated. And when I saw what my uterus looked like, essentially there was no there was nowhere in my uterus for an egg or an embryo to implant and grow because it was there was just so many fibroids which are essentially tumors only to find out that I also have um, endometriosis spots all over and there's just a lot going on the the good thing was that there was a solution um, there was an answer for this so basically my biggest fibroid I think I had gosh I can't remember how many now over a dozen the biggest one was a tumor that was growing out of the back side of my uterus and was the same size as my uterus and the reason why my periods were so painful I always thought tumors were like soft and kind of jelly if you've ever watched um, you know shows I thought they were like softer like a growth if you will but apparently fibroids are like solid protein and basically they're rocks so when you're having cramps at your time of the month if you have fibroids your muscle is is literally cramping around a rock so if you have rocks essentially all in your uterine wall growing on the inside in the middle and on the outside like I did yeah no wonder it's painful because you're literally like squeezing rocks so anyways all that being said she referred me to an incredible doctor 
um, who was doing a newer procedure. Now I'm so, so happy that in the last couple years, so many more doctors are doing it. I'm going to leave his um, website below because I know there are so many women out there who are dealing with things and maybe, you know, your doctor doesn't really have an answer or isn't familiar with this, but there is an answer. It literally, this surgery is the reason I have a child today. So I'm going to put a little plug for Dr. Bruce Lee. Yes, like the martial artist, um, but down below in the description of this podcast. Um, but yes, so I had that surgery and came out of it. Super simple surgery too, but I had had that surgery where they didn't necessarily cut into my uterus. It wasn't a myomectomy, which I know is a very technical term, but that's essentially a C-section. It wasn't that. It was far less invasive, but they did cut into my uterus um, a little bit. So... That brings me to present day, um, or at least when we had Ashton. So I had had that surgery. So, and then obviously we went through the loss of our first daughter. I almost lost my life. I had bleeding issues. So all of that, the surgery, the loss, um, me ending up almost dying, all of those things were brought into the pregnancy with Ashton. So I had very, 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 you know, intense eyes on the pregnancy the whole time, which I appreciated. I mean, I was labeled high risk. I never once received it. I didn't speak it over myself that I was high risk because I was truly, truly believing that I was going to get to meet this baby girl and that there was no risk because if it's written in heaven, it's written here on earth and this girl is going to get into my arms. So I didn't speak anything like that over myself. However, I did say the doctors are viewing me and taking care of me as a high risk pregnancy, even though I know that there's no risk. This girl's coming. Um, so because of that, obviously, they really wanted to, I mean, I had appointments literally weekly. And especially, um, I lost our first daughter at 27 weeks. And so from, I think, 25 weeks all the way to the end, I saw the doctor weekly because they didn't want anything to um, slide under the radar. So that being said, I was 38 weeks pregnant, 38 weeks in one day, pregnant with Ashton. I remember we had a terrible storm, like terrible blizzard storm, like two, three feet of snow, something crazy like that. And I was like, no, like, how am I going to get to the hospital if the roads are snowed? Like, oh my gosh, I was kind of starting to have a little anxiety and stress about that. And then um, I also remember uh, because of COVID, obviously, um, shipping times when you buy things are a lot longer and we didn't have our stroller or our car seat. The stroller I didn't really, you know, didn't really matter, but you need a car seat. You need a car seat to take the baby home in. And it kept saying like, oh, it's going to arrive tomorrow. And then it kept pushing, oh, in two days. And I'm like, okay, I'm 38 weeks pregnant. Like I really need the car seat to get here because they had talked about inducing me at 39 weeks, which I didn't want to do, but I was just every single day I was just praying because my one prayer with this pregnancy and delivery was like, I don't want to play God. I don't want to say, oh, let's opt for the C-section just because it's quote the safe one. And the reason why it's quote safe is because, oh, let's get her out of your stomach as quick as possible so that she can't die in there um, without us knowing like what happened last time. And I was just like, no, I don't want to bring last pregnancy into this one. They are two completely separate events. And I knew it in my spirit and in my heart that the same thing was not going to happen. So in that, of course, the temptation is to want to be induced. Also, when they're telling you you're going to have like a nine, 10 pound baby, you're like, oh, that's a little tempting too. Just because like, you know that it happens all the time. You know that I literally, as women, we were created to do this. But at the same time, it's like, oh God, that's really big. Do I want to do this? But you know what? He knows what we can handle. And he was in control the whole time. But basically, all that being said, I really wanted the car seat. And my mom was supposed to fly in and her flight got canceled because of the weather. And I said, well, shoot, I don't want to go into labor without a car seat and without my mom. Because she was going to help watch Coda while we were in the hospital. And because we didn't have any friends or family. I mean, we had a couple friends, but we didn't have anyone that could, you know, we had no community in New York. And so... She got in on a, on a Saturday. She flew in on that Saturday as soon as the um, weather cleared up. The stroller and car seat got there on that same Saturday. And I remember saying that night, I'm like, huh, okay, I can go into labor now. The next morning on Sunday, guess who went into labor? Yep, me. And so I could feel, 
I could feel her, you know, I could feel my uterus contracting and just pushing her down. So I got on my contraction app and I started recording and it was, they were unrelenting. It wasn't painful. I could feel the contractions, but they weren't, I wasn't dying. My water hadn't broken, but within, I mean, gosh, within a half hour, an hour, the app is saying, go to the hospital, go to the hospital. And luckily because I was labeled a high risk pregnancy, my doctors were very involved and you know, I had their phone numbers. There were two doctors in this practice and I had both their phone numbers. And so I called and they said, okay, you know, because of COVID, you can't labor in the hospital, at least in New York. So you can't just go in there, you know, because some women labor for three, four days. And basically, if you're going to labor, you need to labor at home. Or if you come into the hospital, we're either doing a C-section or we're inducing. Basically, if you're, if we're going to admit you into the hospital, we need to have a ballpark as to when you're going to be out of here because they didn't want people in the hospital. But I wanted to labor at home anyway as long as I could. And so I was there, I was just laboring at home, trying to eat. Um, but when you're in labor, you don't really want to eat. At least I didn't. I was like, it's, and it was nonstop. I mean, my contractions were a minute long, minute, maybe a little bit longer lasting. And then I would have a minute to two minutes break. Sometimes it was shorter contractions and shorter breaks. It was rarely ever longer. So going into that night, um, it was the same story. And as the day progressed, they did get more painful. Um, it was still totally fine. And I wasn't like, I'm dying. But it definitely was starting to get more intense. I was starting to have a little bit more pain. I was like, okay. And then I went to, by the time I went to bed that night, it was like 10, 11 o'clock at night. And I had still been in contact with my doctors, but I just had a gut feeling. I'm like, she's not coming right now. I would know. I was praying that I was like dilating, um, with every contraction that came, I would like literally squat into it. I just bounced on my ball all day and just breathed and rubbed my belly and it was just talk to her. I'm so excited to meet you. And you know, my mom and Kellen were like, how you feeling? How you doing? But man, that night was rough. Oh my gosh. I, the physical part of it, like the physical of the contractions and the pain, totally, totally doable. And I shared earlier that I had incredibly painful periods. This was nothing compared to that. I was like, oh, this is easy. The difference that I did not expect and couldn't have expected was the physical exhaustion because I didn't sleep at all because I literally, I had my app going and I remember being in bed and every time a contraction hit, I would just like, oh, you kind of like try to relax, but you just breathe through it kind of put my hands on my belly and I was like, oh, it would last. I would just breathe through the contraction. Oh, and then as soon as it was over, I remember I fell asleep and then another one came and I woke back up and I was like, oh, did I just sleep for like 20 minutes? And I looked at my phone and it had been 45 seconds. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I did not sleep at all that night. My body would try to put me to sleep because it was so physically exhausted. But the time between my contractions was, I mean, a minute two minutes at the most. But by that point, I don't think any of them were two minutes apart. It was like a minute apart. So by five in the morning, I called the doctor because it's starting to get incredibly painful. And so I called the doctor. I'm like, hey, I think I want to go to the doctor or want to go to the hospital. I'm so tired. And I just like, it's getting so painful. And so he said, okay, go ahead. So Kellen and I hop in the car, 5 a.m., icy roads, so cold. We get to the hospital because of COVID. Obviously, Kellen can't come in with me. So I, well, he drops me at the curb. He walks me to the door, but that's it. So then I go inside. I tell the, the you know security guard, oh, I'm in labor. So then he tells me, oh, go in the elevator up to whatever, third floor. So I get up there and I go to the desk and I say, hi. And every few seconds, well, really every 30 seconds to a minute, I'm like having to pause because I'm having a contraction. And so I'm enjoying the walking because I'm hoping I walk her out. But I'm also like every 30, every like minute, I'm like, hold on. I'm like breathing through it so a couple times I had to like hold on to a knob and just squat down on the ground and I was like okay and then it would pass and I'd stand back up and I'd walk over and so they put me in triage and they hooked my belly up to the fetal monitor monitoring the heartbeat and stuff and you know how they have the printout with the paper with the graph of your contractions um, same as like a, a heart monitor, you know, it prints out, it keeps a record of what, your, you know, your heart rate is. So it's same thing, but with the baby's heart rate and contractions and the contractions would go up off the sheet 
I don't know where the peak was and then they would come back down and then up and off and I had like three or four nurses come in and they were all like oh my gosh I can't believe you're so calm like can you feel this happening right now and I'm like yes I can like there was a big one that came and I was like breathing through it and she goes oh my gosh she's like are you feeling this I'm like yes I'm feeling this I'm in labor like what kind of a question is that I also have been up for almost 24 hours at this point with no sleep so I'm getting like just I'm just I'm in the zone. I am so focused and I'm like, just admit me. Let's get this baby out. So then one nurse comes in, checks my cervix. I am one centimeter dilated. And I was like, what? God, why? And so basically they send me home. They're like, nope, we can't have you in here. You gotta go. And I was like, are you joking me? So I was super frustrated because I just wanted to be in the hospital to labor you know, I, I wanted, I had my whole, I didn't have a birth plan. I had a wish list. I think most women who have lost a child probably can attest to this, which is if you've lost a child, you don't really care how the baby gets here. You just want your baby to be alive and hopefully healthy and happy. And same with you, alive and healthy and happy. And so I didn't really care how she got here. But I was like, oh man, and I didn't want to be induced necessarily. I really wanted my body to do what it was created to do. And so then my doctor is like, said something that was a little interesting because in my mind, I was like, we financially are able to do this, but what about all the people that aren't? If you're familiar with New York, we were living in Brooklyn and my doctor was on the Upper East Side. So in traffic, could have taken a long time. We had a car, so we were going to drive. We weren't taking um, public transportation. But um, the doctor basically said, hey, if you want, gra it sounds like you're definitely in labor. You're in active labor. Um, I want to check or, you know, basically stay nearby. You can't go to the hospital. The office isn't open yet. So go to a hotel, just check into a hotel, hang out there, and then we'll reassess in another like hour or two. And I'm like, this is the middle of New York City. Like this is Manhattan. Hotel rooms are not cheap. We're not in the middle of nowhere. And just to like, oh, let's just drop hundreds of dollars when you're already spending so much money to deliver a baby. I was like, this is very interesting. I was grateful that we technically are in the financial position. It wouldn't break the bank to do that, but it just, I remember just, kind of being turned off by that and maybe that's because I have had situations in life where like I haven't had a lot of money so I know the value of it but anyways I was exhausted Kellen was also exhausted because he wasn't sleeping he was like you're in labor every time I had a contraction I was like oh breathing through it and so he wasn't sleeping obviously so we're both so tired so he said let's just go around the corner there's a really close hotel we'll just get the room he had so much favor, I guess that they were able to give him like a day rate or something. Oh, because it was early in the morning. I think that's what it was. And so he called and usually check-in isn't until three or four. So he calls and he's like, this is the situation. Is there anything you can do? And so basically they kind of gave us a room, I think for like a half day, which was incredible. So again, in labor, it started getting so painful, guys. I was like, oh Jesus, but I still was not in enough pain to be like induced let's get the ball rolling I was like L I want my body to do what it was created to do so we went to the hotel Kellen was able to pass out and get some sleep I was not so now we're beyond 24 hours awake and we the office is open we go into the office they hook me up to the fetal monitor again that um, hook my belly up to monitor her heart rate and the contractions and they too were like wow yep this is back to back and the one thing the doctor said which I have heard a couple friends of mine say some people don't want Pitocin or the reason why they hated their delivery was because they got Pitocin and their contractions were back to back to back to back to back because Pitocin um, apparently causes you to contract. It doesn't do it on the time clock that your body naturally would. It just administers medicine to make it contract whenever it wants. So I have some friends that were like, the Pitocin made me contract every minute and it was horrible and all this stuff. And I'm like, well, shoot, it wasn't the, maybe it wasn't the Pitocin because that was what my body was doing just naturally on its own. It really wanted to get her out. So there was one tiny little, um, abnormality in her heart rate. And they were like, normally we wouldn't even really clock this, but because of your history, you know, it's something that we want to keep a closer eye on. 
And then they wanted to do an ultrasound just to make sure she was in the right position, that she was okay. And so I lay down and I am having so much pain. And then it dawns on me, I'm not having pain in my whole uterus. I'm only having pain in one place. And it is getting, I mean, extraordinarily stronger. And it's acute pain. It feels like I'm being stabbed. It is so painful. And so I remember feeling my stomach because your belly is so big and it was like on the underside of my belly. And I remember asking Kellen, I'm like, oh my gosh, is this where my is this where my incision from my fibroid surgery was? Which is why I started with that story so that I could um, kind of bring you up to speed with why we ended up with a C-section. And my, I was I was having the most intense pain at my at the incision site, and it's a small incision, like an inch, inch and a half. It's not big. But their concern was, if I'm having that much pain at an incision site, it could be one of two things. It could be scar tissue, um, which in that case I wasn't worried about because, you know, scar tissue hurts. I've had surgeries. It's painful, but it's not life-threatening. And I can push through pain as long as I know it's not life-threatening. But because of what I've been through, I'm like, if this is at all life-threatening, it's not worth it. And so they said it could be scar tissue or... It could be the fact that you that because of the incision, because your muscle, your uterus was literally cut through, and now it is completely stretched out because of the pregnancy, the wall of your uterus could be thin. And the one thing we do not want is for the wall of your uterus to burst. Because obviously if that ruptures, immediate surgery, it goes into life-saving tactics. We gotta save the baby, we gotta save you, and it's an automatic hysterectomy. There isn't any coming back from that. So they basically said, hey, this is, these are the risks. I tend to be a little risk averse now, adverse. <laughs> I'm like, I don't want, I have an aversion to risk. I'm not, it's not worth it to me. So if there is risk in things, unless God is saying go for it, not worth the risk, just not worth it for me. So we ended up, um, so she said, I would highly recommend, let me call, because you know, I also was seeing, which I didn't say before, it was a, um, uh, maternal fetal medicine specialist, which you see for high risk pregnancies. Um, they just monitor things a little closely. They have a special skill set when it comes to high risk mothers and births. And so she's like, let me talk to him uh, real quick. Let me call him. And he's at the hospital and then, you know, let me, I'll come back in. And so I was like, okay. So she leaves, comes back in. And while she's gone, I talked to Kellen. I said, Hey, if she comes back and says, we need a C-section, how do you feel about that? And he's like, I feel fine. How do you feel? And I'm like, I feel fine. Actually, I didn't want to be the one to make this decision. I didn't want to say, Oh, give me a C-section because she was too big or I thought she was going to be too big or because for any reason other than it was, it needed to be intervened. Cause I don't believe in having a C-section just to have one. That's just personal belief. I'm like, I was created to do this unless I'm in danger or the baby is, I don't want to get cut open. I've had surgeries, surgeries, they suck. I hate to say it. The recovery is so much longer. I don't want to do this, but if this is the safest, then let's do it. Like no discussion. So yeah, basically they come back in and they say, she says, I talked to him and we really, we really feel like, obviously it's your decision, but we really feel like a C-section would be best. And I said, I feel good about that. And Kellen said, yep, I feel good. I called my mom. I said, hey, this is what's happening. Cause she was at our house with, with um, Coda and we had been gone for obviously a while at this point. Um, probably, yeah, we left at like four in the morning. It's like four in the afternoon now in the doctor's office. And I said, hey, this is what's going on. They think we should do a C-section. And she's like, you know what? This is the first time since you went into labor yesterday morning that I have peace. She goes, for whatever reason, and I don't know why, I've just been praying for you. And the moment you said C-section, I have peace. She goes, which is so funny because we were praying that you'd be able to have a natural or vaginal birth. And I said, same, same. So I was like nervous and excited, but there was just something that felt so right about it, even though there was a little bit of disappointment, but the disappointment was so self-centered. <laughs> so it wasn't like it was, I wasn't going to not do this for my own, you know, it's not on my wish list or it's not on my birth plan. I was like, whatever is safe, I do feel like this is the right thing to do. So we get in the car, we go back to the hospital. Um, by the time, I mean, we're literally like across the street from the hospital. We got there in three to five minutes. And by the time I got there, the doctor was already there in the lobby in scrubs, fully masked up, every like ready to go to the OR. And he was like, okay, you, you're, you are next basically. Like as soon as we get you up there and get your um, epidural, you're going in. Like you are an emergency C-section. We have halted all other C-sections to get you in. And I was like, 
oh my gosh, like this is serious. Kind of freaked me out, but I was also like, yeah, I get to meet her sooner. But then Kellen had to park three blocks away because it's New York City. So he had to go to a parking garage blocks away, carry our stuff over. And so I'm like, well, is my husband going to be back in time? Because I am I, I can, but I don't know. I don't want to do this by myself. I want him here. And so he's like, oh, no, he should be back in time. So we go up to the room. They administer a COVID test because if you're going to be admitted to the hospital, they have to administer a COVID test. One thing I will say is that we had had COVID um, like a month and a half prior. So this was February 22nd. We had had it like beginning of January. Um, and it was not thank the Lord, it was not a big deal for us. Kellen was over it in 48 hours. It took me about a week. Um, I was eight months pregnant, so I think that most of my energy was going to the baby, not to fighting it, but even still, seven days. I didn't lose smell, I didn't lose taste. Um, it was very, I, if I can say, mild for my whole family got it, Kellen's whole family got it, so many friends have gotten it. And um, anyway, some of us had it mild, some of us had it more severe. I had it mild, which was great. And so that being said, they do the COVID test. I get the epidural, which is such a wild experience. Oh my gosh. So I get the epidural and all the while I'm kind of still thinking like, Lord, I'm not playing God, right? Like, you, I hope that this is your will. Like, what if she wasn't meant to come for another week? Like, I don't want to be, or, you know, what if I'm going to be in labor for, you know, four or five days? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to take over what you're doing. And so I was just kind of like confident, but there are all, there's those little thoughts. I'm also exhausted. I've been up for Gosh, I don't even know. However long at this point. Going on 36 hours, I don't know. And so I'm not, I don't feel like sober minded, if you will. I feel just exhausted. And so they give me the epidural. Anesthesiologist was wonderful. Nurses were fantastic in that pre-op situation. I lay back and I have this, you know, if you've had an epidural, you know, like the, the sensation is wild because from your rib cage up, you feel everything and you're fine. From the rib cage down, you just feel fuzzy. Like you don't feel pain, but you do feel pressure and it's so wild. And so I lay back literally. Okay, you're all set. You can lay back. Epidural is in or administered. So I lay back and all of a sudden I feel this whoosh this gush between my legs, which is TMI if you're a guy, but if you're a girl, if you've ever had like a heavy period, it was like that kind of feeling. But I didn't know if it was the medication, I didn't know if it was the anesthesia or if it was actually, um, I, I didn't know what it was. I'm like, what? what's going on? Do I have something happening down there? Like, I can't really feel it anymore. And so I asked the doctor or the nurse, I was like, hey, I feel like I felt something like, I don't know if you can look. And so she comes over and she's like, your water broke. And it was completely like, not provoked it just was always going to break in that moment so my water broke and she goes this girl is coming like it's her time and that was such that was like a wink from god kind of like hey girl i got you and it really just gave me perfect peace about going into that c-section because i was like okay i'm not forcing her to come before she's ready she is ready god wants her here now my water broke i already had the epidural so i'm i didn't have any pain so then after my, cause I've heard that once your water breaks, your contractions get a little bit more painful. Um, but luckily I had already had, I had already had the epidural. So then the contractions were coming and she's like, do you feel that? I'm like, no, it was the first time in like so long that I was like, oh, I feel relief. I was so tired, but I'm like also running on adrenaline cause I'm about to meet my baby. Like what the heck? This is incredible. So Callan comes up, they give him his um, COVID test. We're waiting on the results for both of those. Go into the OR, y'all. Whew, C-sections, no joke. No pain, totally fine, not a big deal, um, but wild, wild. Because you're literally cut open and awake. Like the psychological thing, physically you're fine. It's not a big deal. I did have a reaction to the anesthesia where I was shaking uncontrollably. I hate that feeling. It is the worst feeling ever. It's like you're shivering because you're cold, but you're not actually cold. It's just the anesthesia doing something to your body. So I hated that, but it was crazy. Kellen had, <laughs> with all the crazy protocols going on, you would think that they would maybe want him to be like, keep his distance a little more. There's a little um, curtain, you know, when you're looking, when, when there's a C-section happening so that the mom can't see what's going on. Usually the dad is down there by the mom's head, like, hey baby, you got this, let's listen to some music, you got, and we were just all talking, especially him and the doctors, 
and he's standing up leaning over the window like over my open cavity my op open abdomen asking questions so what's that what organ is this what is this what is that uterus da, da, da. he watches them cut me open do all the cotter like everything he's cracking people up they're laughing and i'm like oh my gosh kellen like what is happening and i was so excited but also it's so like i had to really breathe because every time the magnitude of what was happening would come i would just kind of like i wouldn't freak out but it was a lot so basically i just was breathing through it kellen's making everyone laugh then they pull her out and show me and i'm like oh my gosh like if you guys have ever had a child those of you who are mothers when they pull out your baby and that baby is either crying or just wiggling around and looking at you you are like i mean it was like instant like i wanted to cry but i couldn't cry because there's too much emotion and I was like, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. So then they were like, here's your baby. And then they took her over to clean her up. And Kellen's like, I'm so, we're just smiling ear to ear. Kellen and I are so beaming with pride and so happy. And he's like, hey, do you want me to stay with you or can I go be with her? And I said, no, go be with her. Because we both were like, she is not ever going to be by herself in this hospital, ever. And so one of us will be with her. And so obviously I can't go anywhere. I'm freaking on the table, opened up. And so he went over there with her. He's talking to her, singing to her in the OR. It was so cute. And he still sings. He, for whatever reason, this little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, came out of his mouth. And to this day, every time he sings that to her or over her, she just goes right to sleep. She's so peaceful. It's the sweetest thing. Um, so yeah, it was just an incredible, incredible experience. And she came into the world. We then found out, unfortunately, because what they didn't tell us, because it was such an emergency, they usually ask, have you had COVID in the last 90 days? And if you have, they don't test you because they know it will come up positive for approximately 90 days. So then our COVID tests come back and they're positive. So anyway, I'm gonna end this now because the rest of the, the, rest of the time in the hospital was really, really horrible experience. But that being said, we have our daughter. It doesn't matter. I don't care about the rest of it. It wasn't, let me just encourage you if you're pregnant, the birthday is not an end point it is the launching pad into the rest of your life so if you don't have the perfect labor the perfect delivery the perfect birth the perfect going home pictures and outfits who flipping cares you have your baby and you get to start the rest of your life take cute pictures when you get home take cute pictures when you get into your own space and area and bed but the beauty and the, the exciting thing is that you're alive. You're listening to this. Your baby is alive. They're on your chest. They're nursing or whatever you choose to do. It is an incredible experience. And I just don't want anyone to miss it because of their expectation. So I want you to expect the best, but I want you to be open for all those little tiny details because as long as you give it to God, he will make sure everything is okay and perfect and you will have your little baby. So anyways, that is Ashton's birth story. She came into our world February 22nd on a very cold winter day, but the next morning, February 23rd, when we woke up, it was sunny, the snow started to melt away, and every day since then, our life has been filled with that much more sunshine because of her. So anyways, I hope you enjoyed our little birth story, and gosh, we're just soaking it all up. If you are going to deliver soon, I just pray protection over you and your baby, and um, that it would be a great experience. So yeah, I love you guys so much and I will see you next time. Bye.